For 20 years, we've been creating innovation in the CX industry. And now we're seeking out brilliant new perspectives on CX you just won't find anywhere else. I'm Richard Owen. Welcome to the CX Iconoclast. My guest today, Das Nariandas, is the Edsel Bryant Ford Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. His list of academic accomplishments in this role is lengthy, but I like to think of his achievements this way. He's simply one of the top 10 academics in the world today, focused on B2B sales and marketing. In that regard, he has focused on strategic planning, Salesforce management, new product development, channel marketing, and market communications, three books, countless articles, and a never-ending list of corporations who count on his expertise for management and leadership development. Our discussion naturally covers decades of B2B client relationship expertise, but in particular, Dash shares insights from his groundbreaking marketing dissertation, where he emphasizes the nuances of long-term supplier customer dynamics. And from there, we transition to critical aspects of customer selection, service, and indeed the evolving landscape of customer lifetime value. I think Das offers a unique perspective on strategy, where he advocates for the dynamic nature and continual alignment with the most attractive customer profiles. Of course, we naturally also talk about AI, and Das recounts his transformative journey through the pandemic, translating complex data science into some quite practical business applications. I found particularly interesting his views on the intricacies of human-machine interaction and predictive analytics, navigating biases with what he describes as a healthy skepticism approach, and the concept of augmented intelligence. How there he shares a compelling aha moment that for him underscores the power of predictive analytics in shaping business strategies. Enjoy. That's Narendra. Thank you very much for joining us here today. It's good to see you. Um, I'd like to start, if I could, with a recollection from not long after, I think, the first time you and I met. And uh, we had our very first Net Promoter Conference, and I want to say it was like 2008, and it was in New York. It was um, at the Essex House, right on, um, uh, right on um, Central Park. And you were, our, I believe, our first opening speaker for the whole conference series. And you said something at the time that was that stuck, stuck with me ever since. Uh, you had a two-by-two, two, which I'm sure you have like a thousand different two-by-twos because it's a professional obligation. In, in your business. And I think you characterize customers who were neither financially attractive nor particularly loyal to a business as strategic because that was the excuse people constantly gave for why they continue to do business with them. You remember uh, too well and you remember too much, Richard. That's, well, it, it just goes to show what a, and it's something I quote frequently because it's had a profound impact. So perhaps you could start by talking a little bit about the arc to your research work, you know, go way back in time, perhaps, and start, how did you get into business-to-business -business marketing, and what's been the sort of direction your research has taken over the years? Sure. Uh, so, you know, uh, when I came to the U.S. Uh, to do a Ph.D. in management science uh, with a major in marketing, I mean, the, the in thing then was uh, using... Uh, logistic regression and uh, doing brand choice models using scanner panel data. I mean, and, you know, there was one data set with coffee, you know, uh, purchases and another data set with some uh, cola. And uh, for some time, I tried my hand at uh, doing that. And, you know, uh, at best, I could replicate what had already been done. Uh, but it was hard for me to come up with something interesting something new and you know a phd is about pushing the frontier so um you know not being successful in trying to figure out consumer marketing i kind of uh, thought about what i should do next and realized that the one place where i had a an advantage was my own background i had worked in b2b sales and uh, marketing for six years before i went to do my P came to the U.S. to do my Ph.D. and so uh, I said, let me go and uh, go back to my roots and uh, focus on what I understand and what I do well. And so uh, that was where it got started, um, and it, the right thing to do because uh, you know ever since then I've been focused in this area. So my dissertation was actually 
uh, essays on uh, managing long-term buyer-seller relationships in B2B markets. Uh, my One of my dissertation papers, which um, is uh, frequently quoted because it was one of the earliest papers in the academic journals, in the Journal of Marketing, was uh, a, a, a paper using uh, empirical data to validate if being in a long-term relationship made sense to the supplier. Till then, there was data uh, on how uh, customers benefited from uh, long-term relationships. You know, so Toyota, I mean, just picking one company, I mean, uh, you know, uh, gets benefits from having long-term relationships with, with its suppliers. But for anybody who's done business, uh, B2B, I mean, uh, working with large customers uh, isn't an easy thing to do. I mean, uh, the power is on the other side and they know how to kind of get the most out of you. And the point that you made, strategic, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> accounts, uh, you know, that's the classic example. You're typically your largest customer uh, happens to be those where uh, your cost of serving them is very high and uh, you don't get much in return. So while it was very well established that customers benefit both in B2B and B2C, in having long-term relationships with suppliers. There was no empirical evidence that whether the suppliers did well. You know, it was it was evident in B2B, in B2C, you know, where brands benefited from loyal customers. But you know, do you know if you're a professional service firm, if you're an accounting firm, or you're a hard hat uh, traditional industrial marketer, I mean, supplying to these large customers, does it make sense? So that's really what I looked at in that paper. And what I found there, which uh, is uh, interesting, is that, uh, uh, yes, the large customers squeeze you out. Your margins, your gross margins are uh, lower when you deal with large customers as compared to, you know, being in a transaction orientation with uh, your customers. But where you benefit from are your sales and marketing costs. You know, so that was the first time we had empirical evidence that uh, big customers squeeze you out, but dealing with big customers also makes you more efficient in uh, your sales and marketing activities. And so my journey started there. That was what I did in my uh, dissertation. Uh, it was very well received. It's even today one of the most frequently quoted papers because I was one of the first to <laughs> prove it. So you know, there's an advantage to proving something before anybody else does. Because and, and, others and, have no choice but to talk about what you did. <laughs> well, and in some ways also, you know, B2B marketing, it, 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 you know, has never, never achieved the level of focus that the consumer side has, right? Yeah. And we're all taught early on that the problem with doing business with consumers is they don't respect your right to make a profit. So there's this notion that consumers big problem because at the end of the day, even if they have brand loyalty, they don't care whether you make money. Whereas in theory, you've got this um, maybe asymmetrical, but you never let's have this relationship with uh, your customer in B2B, which says they want you to be around. Yes, they may, they may push you, but they have a stake in your success to a degree. Um, and so that, that nature of the relationship is so fundamentally different. But but not well examined. I mean, people sure. people haven't spent the time and effort thinking about how these B two B relationships play out. Absolutely. So I've spent the last thirty odd years uh, focused in this area on uh, client relationships. Initially, it was in product marketing firms, uh, spread then to professional service firms as well. Uh, but my primary focus has been B two B. But nowadays, I kind of look at B two C too. But if you ask me, my DNA is B2B and kind of look at how do you select which, how do you select customers you want to serve? You know, we all know that the best time to say no is right at the beginning, whether it's interpersonal relationships or interfirm relationships. Uh, you know, but how often do we do that? Do we have the discipline to say yes or do we say no? And you and I, Richard, have talked about this at length that the very point that you just made, you know, we land up uh, not, not, not getting into good relationships. Uh, you know, but once you select, you need to then be very clear how you want to serve your customers. You know, there are some customers who want hand-holding, some who don't. There are some customers, so different customers play different roles. So you need to serve them in different ways. So selection is important. Mm. How you serve them is important. 
and then you know you got to constantly monitor whether they are getting you know they're getting value from you you know whether you measure it through satisfaction or loyalty there has to be some way for you to understand whether you are satisfying them and then at the end of the day i mean uh, you need to survive to play another day so select serve satisfy and survive and as i tell my you know i teach entrepreneurs and uh, business people now senior you know pe people who run businesses and i tell them you select you serve you satisfy you survive but then thrive if possible and and one of the points you've made in the past which again i i constantly steal and use um and only slightly represents as my own is that the nature of that selection means that to some extent it's inevitable that you become the business based on the customers you do select right and the idea the idea that you have any control of selection first of all is is something a lot of marketers don't fundamentally think of because yeah. pressure is there to essentially drive revenue and the idea of being selected you know is is sort of almost a foreign concept then the second concept that says well if you then organize your operations to serve those customers, um, then you know, you're building your company in a way that suits them. And I think there's also a great quote from Peter Fader, who I know you know over at Wharton, and he talks about account-based marketing, and it's all about customer selectivity and, and building your operations to serve the profitable customers at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. Um, so you know, I think we're more sophisticated companies now thinking about this. and the shift surely towards thinking of customers through the lens of lifetime value makes it even more important because you can no longer look at that initial transaction and say, oh, this is great. We can make money on the deal. You have to think about, you know, the, the next 10 years. Absolutely. I mean, like the point that you just, when you started off, just uh, when you, what you mentioned is important. I mean, as I keep saying, who you serve affects who you become. Who you become impacts who you can serve and every time you decide to serve a customer especially in b2b markets it's 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 an endogenous decision i mean there's an endogenous effect who you decide to serve impacts your resources impacts your capabilities it uh, it's like you know the you know the very act of picking a customer changes your trajectory this is that old heisenberg uncertainty principle the act of locating an object uh, moves that object. I mean, uh, you know, similarly with the, the act of serving a customer doesn't move the customer, but it moves you. And, uh, you know, I am appalled by the amount of time, you know, uh, business people, people I work with, they spend an inordinate amount of time talking about strategy. But what they don't recognize is that when it comes to execution, every time you make a customer selection decision, you are affecting yourself. So strategy has to be dynamic. I mean, uh, because execution is constantly changing you. And if you're not careful and thoughtful in what you do, I mean, uh, you'll end up with two problems. One, you're serving customers you should never have served. But worse still, you don't have the capacity to serve customers who come down the road who might be fabulous opportunities for you to serve. Yeah, or you're bending your whole operation in, in, in a in a direction that, that is Absolutely. going to thwart good opportunities going forward. And in so few companies, you, you can't be good at a lot of things for a lot of customer segments. Right? It's very, very challenging. Impossible. Impossible. Trying to be everything to everybody, not going to work because strategy at the end of the day, like Porter says, is about making choices. And choices need to be made because our resources are limited. And recognizing that cycle makes it virtuous. Uh, not understanding that cycle will make it vicious on you. So how does that bring you now to your recent work, which has been around and has talked about the impact of artificial intelligence on this? And that's, um, you know, I think really current thinking. Obviously, AI is a very hot topic, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So particularly interested in, in, in your perspective on this. So I, you know, Look, I mean, years ago, a really long time ago, I mean, in a galaxy far away, when I was a PhD student, I mean, uh, 
you if you going to going to do a phd in management science you're going to do multivariate statistics i mean uh, you know heavy duty stuff i mean uh, and so analytics has always been part of you know is my i grew up with it and then i saw all these things happen over the decades and to be honest i was a bit cynical saying that this is just old stuff being wrapped in new ra- wrappers or you know poured into new bottles kind of a thing and so when covid hit and uh, i had to start teaching from my basement uh, and uh, w- you know it actually opened up the world for me because uh, i realized that when we went especially in this spring of 2020 it became very clear to me that if i did not uh, reinvent myself uh, you know i would be part of uh, you know the has been uh, not the is now thing so i decided with the to with a student of mine who runs a software firm where they develop uh, you know uh, ai based analytics uh, i put together a course it was less about data science because i was not interested in again like as i was in my phd days i mean uh, you know kind of being a follower in a world where many are already kind of you know talking advanced uh, data right. science capabilities my my interest was more on the the yawning gap between the yawning gap between practice and theory you know the gap between data scientists and business people and so i wanted to take a perspective of you know not data science but business science i mean how is business using data and the uh, reason i picked that up is because um, over the last decade even before covid as i was talking to you know uh, you know pe- students people who are teaching most of them had no understanding of uh, data i mean uh, you know what it meant how it how you handle it you know uh, you know for example i mean yesterday i taught a group of senior executives and i was telling them that talk about analytics but to do that you're talking about the 20th floor of a building whose foundation you haven't put in place and they said what do you mean i said in order to get to analytics you need to first understand your data strategy i mean how do you think about it and i'm not one who's going to tell you which format it should be in and what code you need to use and all that but i have one question for you where is your data sitting and if you're telling me it is sitting in five different places in five different corners of the world you know you are you're building your house on shifting sands so it begins there so i got interested in understanding how to take the language of data scientists and bring it into a language that business people understood so that's where we began and you know simple mistakes that get made uh, because data scientists don't understand the business world i mean if you're going to use you know if you're going to use a variable that comes much after the variable that you're trying to predict and if you're trying to predict when uh, you know is someone going to travel to boston and one of the variables you're looking at is did they book a flight to boston uh, in the last 10 days i mean you're going to get an amazingly accurate model that doesn't make that a good model i mean right. uh, you know causality is important to understand so so i so, so i taught a course uh, to the mba students in the fall of 2020 which was all around understand the business aspects of data analytics and how important it was to understand that and then as we did that i mean the focus in that course for me was understanding that humans will make decisions machines will provide information sometimes predictions and more often more often than not in the lives that we're going to live in the coming years a lot of the decisions actually will be a human plus machine interface where humans will make decisions based on information or predictions provided by machines that's where i see it and that's what the data scientists call as a predictive analytics and i've written a, an hbr on this thing to help right. people right it's a, it's a it's a great piece i so i think it's really interesting how how you came by this observation i you know i and it, it, it begs a couple of questions right i think first of all this as you said this gap here between management's understanding of data and analytics versus um a potential or, or let's just say the current current firm that can be used um of course i mean some of that's because you're teaching a course at harvard if you'd been down at mit 
you'd have had a whole group of people who fully understood data and analytics, um, but just couldn't, just couldn't, just couldn't spell correctly. So basically, there's, there's a little bit of bias there. But but I think, but I think this this issue of of how we make decisions in a complementary fashion using machines, as we've introduced predictive analytics into frontline employees, one of the biggest surprises has been. Actually, we were much more nervous about it when we started. We thought people's reaction to what a computer says is, is, a, is a decision that's going to be very negative. I'm not sure what your experience has been, but ours has been one where it, it's, it's not as simple as people saying, oh, I don't trust the data or the machine. People are quite reflective. It's to some extent the difference in perspective that comes from a data versus a human view, right? People, people just intrinsically process information differently than a machine does, and maybe it's just biases at the end of the day. We just have so many intrinsic biases we bring to bear that we end up in different different places. I, you're, you're right. I mean, uh, the way I think about it is you, you know, you, everybody wants to drive at 100 miles per hour. But if you've noticed, the needle needs to go from zero to 100 before you are driving at 100 miles per hour. There is that time. There is that acceleration you need to go through. And what happens is very often business people kind of get thrown in into the stream where everything is moving at 100 miles per hour and they're told, hey, everything is okay. No, I mean, what you need to do is bring them, I mean, from a stationary start to that speed, whatever that is. And that is a, you know, the immersive experience is critical. And when that is not done right, there is a, total rejection because at that point someone's very identity gets challenged and uh, that hurts so you know bring people along gradually with care rather than taking them into from one state to another one which is dramatically different because then you are going to run run into the world of cynicism i mean you know, what you want are as i keep telling people you you can win a skeptic. You can win over a skeptic. You're not going to be able to have a conversation with a cynic because a cynic is not going to have a conversation with you. They've already made up their mind and they're irrational about it. In your, from your perspective, very rational in their mind. But if someone is a skeptic, then they're actually open to suggestion and open to learning. And so the key here, you know, as we want the world of data science to be more pervasive in the world of business is to walk into a world of skepticism, healthy skepticism, rather than a world of unhealthy cynicism. Right. And I find that to be a very simple issue that is not tackled. You know, people kind of come and force, brute force things. Brute forcing things doesn't work. Well, and... and you know, we don't have enough experience, right? So we've, we've got through evolution, we've spent all our, our, our history as a species making decisions based on, you know, anecdotes or people telling stories to each other. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, data gets introduced very, very late in our experience. Um, it, it, and so now we're trying to train everyone to make decisions using data instead of body language. Uh, and instead of storytelling, it's not going to be a painless overnight transition. Right? And, and I think that the, the mathematics of whether or not a prediction is correct, in some ways, is less interesting than can you persuade someone is correct, right? And, you know, if you have a big black box AI machine that spits out an answer, it might be correct, but it's, it's going to have very low value in persuasion. Yes, absolutely. I mean... Uh... You kind of nail the whole issue. I mean, let's not get obsessed with accuracy. Let's get obsessed with performance enhancement. Because well, also we're, trying, we're trying to nudge people, aren't we? Right. I mean, I think that, you know, we've sort of changed even our language. We used to say next best action, and we sort of say next best nudges, because at the end of the day, we recognize that we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're trying to get people to improve their performance marginally. And I'm not just talking about online people, I'm talking about boardrooms. Because you yeah. could argue, and I'm sure your experiences have this, that the group that's often least 
developed in their use of data can be in the boardroom, sure. Absolutely. I've uh, written a, an HBR piece on how actually predictive analytics will solve the perennial problem of sales and marketing integration not happening. But I also kind of finished that article by saying that much as there is so much opportunity, it's not going to happen because the people who need to bring these functions that are siloed together, i.e. the board, the CEO of the board, are the least knowledgeable about the value of doing this. And so, you know, ignorance uh, is not bliss here. Ignorance is dangerous. And that is the issue. This will not happen. You know, this will not be an issue 20 years from now because people will be sitting in the board rooms. Generationally. Those that have yeah. grown up in the digital world, those that have grown up with analytics. But, you know, the, that's the beauty of uh, evolution. There is always a generation that is in, you know, caught in transition. And we are in and, that. And the, and the group that can get in front of that generally the ones that profit the most, right? The, if, you're, if you're one step ahead. So talk a bit more about this idea of the sales and marketing integration, because I, I, I read that in your last piece, and I thought that it was interesting, but it, I have to admit it kind of left me hungry for a little bit more. It seemed like it was a very big, very big topic, because historically sales and marketing functions have struggled to integrate. They tend to think of themselves as upstream and downstream. Certainly in the software industry, I'm most familiar with, the marketing guys kind of want to top spin lob leads or what they call leads over the wall. And the, and the salespeople basically want to take them and complain about them and claim there's not enough. And that, and, and that barrier has been really a concrete wall between the two functions. Right. It's, uh, you know, that has lived forever. I mean, and uh, that's why the two functions are always at each other's throats, even when they sub seemingly are supposed to be having a cardial dinner. I mean, it is, uh, you know, I'm going to have you for a meal kind of a thing. And the only pre person who can solve that, Richard, I mean, as I think you were kind of pointing to, is someone who's sitting above them, the general manager. And the, the way the general manager has to solve it is to figure out where and how resources get allocated. And if at the end of the day, the general manager says, I'm going to allocate resources to stages in the whole pipeline that enhance the probability of a favorable outcome. And I don't care whether it's a marketing function or a sales function. You know, these functions will stop thinking about themselves in a territorial mode and start thinking of themselves more in a firm perspective. What has been lacking is then it made a lot of sense to, for, for firms to organize by functions because organizing by functions allowed for specialization that allowed for you know a better way of doing things but in doing so local optimization was achieved at the expense of a global optimal global. right and it was very hard for the general manager to say okay i'm looking at the revenues of the firm and i you know because there were causality was missing i mean in most of marketing and sales the biggest problem we've had is there is no feedback loop or there traditionally what this world brings, what the world of humans plus machines brings is the finally the presence of a feedback loop. And when you have a feedback loop, you can actually assess the efficacy of your investments. And if the feedback loop is covering the entire value chain, you then start looking at where the biggest constraint is and resolve it. You're no longer saying, should I optimize marketing or should I optimize sales? You're just saying, I need to kind of fix the pipe wherever the plug is and, well, once and, and also that, the downstream win for everyone and, and if i may say also the downstream operations have the same problem so the the barriers between organizations continue past customer acquisition you got the sales and marketing and persist through all the downstream operations absolutely and, and and we know that customers you know don't don't care so this issue of global optimization is a problem for the entire cycle of value chain but that's where the money is, surely. I mean, if you're looking at this as, a, as you said, a general manager and your role is asset allocation, resource allocation, and I mean, the classic textbook in the software industry is trying to solve problems downstream with support functions because you sold to the wrong customer in the first place right. uh, or you sold to a decent customer and then you messed up the onboarding so terribly that now they're unrecoverable. And then your solution is to employ 
huge teams of people, call them success managers or super tech support people, running around trying to put fingers in the dye. We're just completely yeah. banding their way back to normalcy, which, yeah, have you ever tried that? It's very expensive, right? It's one of the reasons that, you know, I think software companies, margins are, are historically been good, but SaaS businesses, I think, have lost the plot a little bit on how they could be smarter in acquisition, again, selective about customers, and also how they can um, mitigate long-term downstream costs in, in, a, in an LTV model. We yeah. now have the data to tell people this, but as you say, it runs across boundaries in organizations, and we're right. still dealing with those hard-drawn boundaries. Yeah, I, You know, that point that you made, I'm kind of with a colleague of mine, we are kind of writing a couple of cases on firms that are looking at the support function, the success factor function you're talking about. And it's no longer an afterthought. I mean, you uh, know, it is uh, in many, in many cases, that is the key success factor for the firm in the long run, because uh, they are the ones who hold the relationship. You know, years ago, the first case that I wrote actually at HBS was a case on Dell Computer Corporation when you know, the case was when Dell was at that point uh, $20 million from bankruptcy. That's where the case begins. It, it had disastrous results yes. with a bunch of I, 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 that they I had remember. launched. I, I, remember it. I remember it very well. Yeah. So in the Dell case, I mean, it's all about the direct marketing and the direct, the direct model. I mean, it was, it was kind of novel at that point. But it, a sidebar there in that case that I had written, which, you know, I... I had not fully understood, but wrote about it, but it took me a while to understand this. You know, there was a field sales organization in, say, you know, in De Dell that would serve the corporate customers, and there was a telesales organization. Now, this is pre-mobile phones. I mean, we still use landlines then. Now, who do you think was the relationship manager? Most people would say, oh, it's the field sales person. No, it was the telesales person. Why? Because that person was available 24 by 7. If a right. customer had a problem, they knew there was someone they could call and they would get them on the line. I mean, um, support is, you know, omnipresent in the delivery of services. To not recognize that and to see that as a necessary cost rather than a delight factor and asking the question, what can they bring to the table in terms of bringing in the right people to begin with? You know, is a wasted opportunity. So I fully agree with you. I mean, the article that I wrote in HBR was more just on sales and service because, I mean, it's marketing and sales. But I'm writing another one on, you know, that's just Very interesting. one part of the picture. Support. The service function is critical. Well, we've, 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 we've wrestled a lot over the years also with the issue of digital versus human factors and support, right? And... You know, again, there's no single answer because there are tasks that are really well suited to digital and customers prefer digital for. And then there are tasks which are ambiguous or complicated and customers want to speak to humans. Um, but software has always been interesting to me because the product is complicated, not well understood, often not well understood by the vendor, let alone the customer. And so, and so, uh, by its very nature, getting value out of that product is is challenging. Customer success sort of emerged as an effort to say, well, how do we how do we help customers get value? But being smart about it, understanding how you can efficiently use those resources has suddenly become very popular because all these companies are under much tighter cash constraints. Absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're in a fascinating time for what you're talking about because um, uh, because the the capital availability environment is finally forcing efficiency. And you could make a pretty, you could make a pretty compelling case that that you're making an argument for global optimization, which is an efficiency argument. It's been unfashionable for the last ten years because who cares about efficiency? Now all of a sudden, time might have come when everybody wants analytics to get smarter. They want to make more uh, efficient, uh, efficient decisions. And and so it's the perfect time for people to get smart with data, and perhaps you know we're, we're sort of running up against time. So I'd love your closing thoughts on that. What what do you see as being next? Where where is the where where are people going to go with these analytic solutions? I think 
I have my own pitch. Might not be a popular one. Might not be something that people want to hear. But uh, before we get to handing over the world to artificial intelligence, I think the next 10 years is about augmented intelligence. And I think we need to kind of senior leaders, especially those that did not grow up in the digital world, those whose roots are still, you know, pretty much in the analog world, need to understand the power of analytics augmenting decision making. And, you know, a few weeks back, I was talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs and I asked them, what do you care about? Uh, so I care about losing customers. And so how do you, how do you want to think about it? Because I constantly keep asking my people, how many customers did we lose? I said, that is great. I mean, uh, do you see a problem with what you're asking? And they said, no. I mean, I'm obsessed about who we lose. And I said, can you do a little better than that? And they just couldn't think of it. I said, wouldn't it be interesting if you knew who you might be losing? They said, well, if I knew that, I could do a lot. I said, well, you know, why don't you ask your team to use analytics to help you figure out customers at risk? And it was like, whoa, I mean, and I'm saying, oh, my God. I mean, you know, that's really where, the, you know, just getting to the basics of shifting the mindset from the world they came, which is customer retention is important, therefore customer attrition is bad. And so it's a binary state to actually saying that you can predict who might attract and therefore actually do something about it is an aha. Now, Richard, if that's an aha, you know where the world is. And yeah, so well, we're going to deal with a lot of such ignorance that you have to overcome one small step at a time. Well, I mean, that's a perfect place for us to end because you just gave an incredibly eloquent sales pitch for our business, perhaps uh, inadvertently, but I'll take it, um, <laughs> our reason for existence. I think I think that at the end of the day, um, you know, I was I would start our conversations with any customer with asking the question, what would you do differently if you could predict the future of your customers? And 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 I argue that it would change just about every part of your operation. If you could if you could look around corners, you would do radically different. So that's the question we should all be asking. What uh, about the future, uh, but as you said, it's it's this fascinating generational shift. So a lot more we could talk about. Um, exactly. We'll, we'll we'll provide in the uh, in in the show notes some links to your most recent publications as well because there's some there's a there's a treasure trust that uh, we could definitely get into. That's as as ever is unbelievably fun to talk about this. We could turn this into a one hour conversation, but we want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much, and right. um, and you know keep. Keep, keep pushing on this idea of um, getting Harvard students to start to use data. I think it might actually really happen one of these days, and you know, might catch on over over there on the hey, other hey, side. Of the river. A, a lot of my colleagues are doing that, Richard. I mean, uh, so I know there is a across the river issue that you and I have to figure out in some time. Well, well, we will we'll, we'll, meet halfway, but uh, we'll settle. We'll on settle it on, on the we'll bridge. <laughs> we'll meet. We'll meet on the bridge. Thanks, Das. I really appreciate it. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the CX Iconoclast from OCX Cognition. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you won't miss any of our thought-provoking conversations. And please get in touch if you want to learn more about what OCX Cognition's predictive CX analytics platform can do for your business by providing complete insights into every account continuously updated and connected to operations. You'll find contact info in the show notes.